Well, if anybody is qualified to talk about this case, it's Mike Florio, who is a lawyer, and he's also one of the best NFL reporters in the country. He joins us now. Mike, you really rocked our world in St. Louis when you brought up the possibility of instead of a cash settlement, if St. Louis wins, the possibility of a team. Can you elaborate, please? Well, it's definitely something that's on the radar screen. It's not a significant possibility at this point, and I think it would require a couple of things. First of all, a significant verdict against the NFL, the kind of thing that would cause them to scramble for some alternative to coming up with $1 billion or more. And also, to the extent that Stan Kroenke, the owner of the Rams, has promised that he'll foot the bill for everything, now, the NFL's lawyers tell them that that language is ironclad and they're safe. There is an acknowledgement by some in the league that if that number reaches a certain level, Kroenke may start looking for an out. And if he can find a plausible out or at least a way to minimize it, that's when it becomes more of a league problem and less of a Kroenke problem. And that's when the possibility of dangling an expansion team could be put on the table. So we got a long way to go to get there. But there is a way that the dominoes fall that the NFL just throws its hands up in the air and says, we'll give you a team. Now, there's a lot of questions that flow from that. But we know when the Browns initially were going to move to Baltimore and become the Browns, before it ever got to litigation, there was a settlement broker that Cleveland would have a team by 1999 after the Browns left to start the 96 season and that the names would stay in place, et cetera. So things are negotiable and the possibility of an expansion team is one of the things that could be negotiated at some point how come this is one of the most underreported stories in the country with the exception of you and a few others nobody is talking about it well i don't know i thought that in july and i was at the beach with my family and i saw the tweet or the article or whatever it was that the judge had found sufficient evidence of fraud on the part of several owners to require them to produce financial information because they may be on the hook for punitive damages. To me, that was the shot that said this is real and it's serious and the NFL could have a major problem on its hands. And I don't know why others didn't view it the same way. I know early in the litigation, ESPN was all over it. They've looked the other way for whatever reason the last three months. I think they had a reporter at that hearing in July and they still didn't write anything about it. So I don't know. I mean, do, do you expect to see anything on NFL Network? I don't. But the other major outlets have just looked the other way. And I think ESPN is the most glaring because at one point in the life cycle of this case, they were paying attention to it. I, it astounds me that, that no one really is now, although I think more people are starting to wake up to the reality that unless there's a settlement, a trial is coming. So is it also because, as you kind of alluded to, that all these other networks are in bed with the NFL and they do not want that relationship to deteriorate? And have you caught some blowback because you've been really out there on this? See, it's kind of hard for me to suggest that the fact that other networks are in bed with the NFL is keeping them silent because I'm proof that that's not true. And I've gotten no blowback from NBC for this, and they're always supportive of what I do. I've been very aggressive this week with the Washington football team investigation and the selective leak of emails to take down John Gruden, et cetera. And, I, and they support me. They know that I'm doing what I think is right, and I'm following the stories that I think the audience is or should be interested in. And so I don't, I don't think that that's it. I don't know. Maybe it's just a guess by these networks that we're going to stay away from any potential third rail when in reality they could cover the case and, and not have any real problems because I'm not having any real problems. Because of the embarrassment from the John Gruden emails, do you think the NFL would be more likely to settle and not go to court because these emails will be exposed and there could be some more embarrassing material about NFL owners? You know, I've given some thought, Frank, to whether or not there's a connection between the Rams litigation and the Washington football team investigation that would justify an effort by the St. Louis lawyers to get those emails. And I can't think of a theory, I can't think of an approach, I can't think of a basis that would be plausible that would connect the two together. And maybe they're smarter than I am, which is entirely possible because it's a low bar. But it would put some heat on the league 
if the lawyers in St. Louis start coming up with a theory saying we want those, I just don't know what relevance they would have to the relocation of the Rams out of St. Louis. But, you know, the NFL has got a, multiple different problems right now, and they're in the midst of a great, exciting season. But they do have some problems, and the question becomes, when do they make good decisions? When do they make the right decisions about how to solve these problems the right way? So you were a practicing attorney, and Bob Blitz is the attorney for St. Louis in this lawsuit. And I'm wondering, I think that a guy like Bob is thinking, I'm going to get 35% of what this settlement could be if there is a settlement. But if a team is involved, how does the lawyer get compensated? Well, everything becomes a matter of negotiation at that point. How are we going to resolve this case? And would it be an expansion team plus a separate payment to the lawyers? How would that work? That, that's all. Once you get the attention of the league, and once you get them sufficiently motivated to try to settle the case, that's when everybody gets in a room, they sit down and they work out the details. And sometimes there's some push and pull and back and forth and egos get involved, shockingly or not. But that all gets figured out before the case finally is resolved. And you know, lawyers have a way, in my experience, of becoming very reasonable about what their fee is going to be if at the end of the day they feel like they have done something for the greater good. And if you can bring back a team to St. Louis with a long-term commitment that it's going to be there, then the lawyers have done something that definitely is in the interests of the, uh, the greater good. You have seen a lot of NFL litigation over the years with the league usually prevailing. What about this lawsuit feels different? Well, it feels different because they have taken loss after loss to get to the point where they're now staring down a trial. And I, I think that what happens in a case like this, and, and I worked on both sides in civil litigation, the defense side and the plaintiff side during the 18 years that I practiced. One of the biggest challenges for a defense firm, which makes its money billing the client by the hour and loves nothing more than to have what they call a cost insensitive client who will pay whatever it takes to fight back this challenge. You, you have to be realistic with your client at all times, even if, it, that, even if that means an early settlement before too many steps unfold in the case. The problem is the law firm that recommends aggressively an early settlement cuts off its ability to make nearly as much money as it could handling the case all the way through. And that's one of the real business dilemmas of a major law firm. When are you as candid with your client as you need to be? And sometimes what happens too is you try to be candid with them and they don't want to hear it because they're right. And we're going to prove that we're right. We're going to fight, fight, fight. There's a point where you got to put down that bravado and you got to be objective. And the moment that they lost their effort to force this case into arbitration, and they knew they were going to be facing a St. Louis judge and a St. Louis jury. That, to me, is the moment they should have embarked aggressively on settling. And definitely, once the gavel bangs on requiring multiple owners to release their financial information because they may be on the hook for punitive damages, that's definitely when you go to the table. The problem, though, is when you go to the table then, the expectations for the plaintiffs are much higher. So whatever you were willing to consider months ago, that's out the window now because the plaintiff lawyers are going to say, sorry, sorry, that was then, this is now. Circumstances have changed. This case has a value that is much higher than it used to be. So I think that's the practical reality here. Any settlement talks are going to happen with the lawyers representing St. Louis realizing they've got a tiger by the tail. Uh, Judge McGraw has ruled with St. Louis basically on every motion. I'm wondering, does this to you seem like a for sure victory for St. Louis? Well, no, nothing's for sure. I, I, one thing I learned early on when practicing law is that anyone who tells you that they know how a case is going to turn out is either lying to you or stupid. There's no in between because no one knows. No one knows who's going to be on that jury. No one knows how the judge is ultimately going to make rulings during trial. No one knows what's going to happen on appeal. And the NFL has a certain amount of bravado as it relates to its expectations for prevailing on appeal. Sometimes you put too many eggs in that basket 
because if you don't prevail on appeal, then you definitely have a huge problem. But I, I think that it, it's encouraging for, for the plaintiffs that the judge seems to be with them. But, you know, I've seen this dynamic play out as well, Frank. And what happens is one side gets all the rulings. One side gets all the right calls in its favor. And then when that side loses at trial, it's got no basis to appeal anything. You wrote that the NFL owners are purposely dragging their feet on turning over documents to St. Louis and maybe laying the groundwork for default judgment on purpose. Now, why would they do that, Mike? Well, I was spitballing there on this notion that I really haven't taken a deep dive into the damages claim. I don't know how the numbers get calculated, and I'm not sure that you can come to the table with a persuasive calculation and presentation of hundreds of millions of dollars in financial losses to St. Louis because the Rams left. But my concern if I was the NFL would be this, the process of proving that the NFL violated the law entails putting some witnesses on the stand who may not be very good witnesses. Jerry Jones may not be a very good witness. Typically owners, commissioners, these are folks who don't like to be questioned. They resent being questioned. They resent having their authority undermined. They resent having to sit there and listen to lawyers and play verbal games. And they try to engage in those games and they can end up performing very badly. So if you have a stream of witnesses, much like the trial from the Seinfeld finale, one after another, and the jury starts rolling their eyes thinking, these people are just, they're begging for a major verdict that then influences what the verdict is. So at a certain point, if you think this thing's going to go off the rails at trial, it's better to just say, we concede liability. Let's just go have a trial on damages. These stories of Stan Kroenke calling Kevin, Kevin Demoff and saying, hey, I found the piece of land, while they're trying to make it seem like they are open to St. Louis retaining the team. Doesn't that seem like game, set, match for St. Louis when you have that documented? Factually, yes, but you still have to pigeonhole the facts into a legal theory that will result in a significant award of damages being awarded to the St. Louis plaintiffs. And I can understand. I don't support it. I don't condone it. I can understand why they did what they did, because here's the problem. And Cleveland went through this in 1995 when they announced they were moving in November. It ends up being a mess for the remainder of your time there. I'm surprised the Raiders let it be known three years before they moved out of Oakland that they were leaving. You basically are disengaging with your local fan base. Now, for the Raiders in Oakland and LA, that's close enough and we still love the Raiders. But if you're too open, if you're too obvious, if you're too clear that you're gonna pack up and leave soon, you're going to be playing in front of an empty stadium. I'm not saying it makes it right, but I can understand why they did what they did. I don't think they did the right thing, especially when they began to downplay and say, oh, well, Stan Kroenke has many properties that he owns, and they start feeding talking points to the commissioner along those lines, and everybody knows that that's the place where the stadium is going to be, and multiple people are not telling the truth about it. So you've written that you don't think NFL owners would be good on the stand, and you made a pretty good uh, analogy with Colonel Jessup. Well, look, here's what happens. And we've all seen the movie A Few Good Men, and Jack Nicholson gets browbeaten by Tom Cruise until he finally snaps. You get these owners on a witness stand. Now, the first challenge, before you even put the witness on the stand, is to get the witness prepared. And I would dread, if I was one of the lawyers representing the NFL, I would dread going into a room and spending a day with Jerry Jones to get him ready to testify because he doesn't want to be there. He doesn't want to do this. He thinks it's childish. He thinks it's a waste of his time. He doesn't need to be treated like this. He understands how to handle himself. I've handled myself for 78 years. I know how to handle myself. I'm a snot-nosed lawyer from St. Louis. That's the attitude you have to pierce through. You have to say to these people, plain and simple, you got to forget everything you've ever done, everything you've accomplished, everything you know. You got to be ready to answer these questions truthfully and you don't get dragged into games with the lawyers and you don't try to impress people because they are going to keep working at you until they get you. Because the lawyers have done it time and again. They know how to look for the tells, the body language, 
the, the little quiver in the voice that tells them that it's starting to go their way. And I, I, I would not be able to sleep the night before having to get one of these owners ready to testify. And I would relish the opportunity to cross-examine one of them at trial because they go in there with an attitude that is gonna be very hard to diffuse that they should be the ones to whom everyone is deferring, not the person sitting up on the bench with the black robe. If it goes to trial and the NFL loses and they appeal, how long could this thing linger? Years. And I think we've already seen that the NFL will take advantage of every available potential appeal. They went to the US Supreme Court on the question of whether or not they would avoid a jury trial altogether and take the case to arbitration. They appealed as much as they could the question of whether or not the financial information of Stan Kroenke would have to be turned over. They will appeal and they will appeal and they will appeal and they will delay and they will delay and they will delay and they'll never concede until the highest court in the land says they must concede. And that's when they start making excuses like, well, we should have won, but the judge was corrupt or the jury was stupid or this was against me, that was against me. And I've seen that time and again too, Frank. The lawyers never want to stand up and say, you know what? We just didn't do a good enough job in representing and advising our clients. It's always someone else's fault when it goes off the rails. Okay, quickies before we let you go, then I want to ask you about your book. Uh, can't hedge on any of these. And I know we, we're not going to hold you to it, but just gut feel. Odds, there's a settlement. Yeah, I, I think there should have been a settlement already. And I think that a settlement pre-trial, I would probably put at 30%. A settlement post-trial, depending upon the size of the verdict, I would probably put it 75 to 80%. Odds it exceeds a billion dollars. I don't know enough about the specific damages calculation because even if there's a huge award of punitive damages, the US Constitution requires that there be a reasonable relationship between the compensatory damages and the punitive damages. For example, and I don't want to make this into a law class, but this is a very simple example. Let's say that I'm worth $10 billion and I punch you in the face and a jury finds that the damage to your face as a result of my measly little punch was $10. The jury then if it turns around and issues an award of a billion dollars against me for punitive damages, well, that ratio is too far out of whack. There's gotta be some connection to the compensatory damages. So I think that would be one of the strong arguments. If there's some massive punitive damages award, it's gotta be at least reasonably tied to the compensatory damages. So I, look, could it get to a billion with a runaway jury that gets upset by what it hears in court? Yes, but it's incumbent on the St. Louis plaintiffs to prove a significant multiple hundred million dollar amount of real damages, real losses in order to support a much larger punitive damages award. Odds uh, there's a team in the settlement. Too, way too early to call. It's on the radar screen. It's flipping on the outside fringe of the radar screen. And as I said earlier, win at trial, get a huge verdict, hope that there's some disarray between Kronke and his partners as to who's gonna pay what, and that's when the commissioner can swoop in and say, oh, wait, I got an idea. Let's just, look, we didn't want to cry uncle. Let's cry uncle. Let's put a team in St. Louis. We need more inventory anyway. We got all this gambling money coming in. More teams means more money for all of us. Let's just put a team in St. Louis and be done with it. Finally, odds that St. Louis ends up victorious. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last question. Odds that St. Louis ends up victorious. I think it's already victorious. I think it's already a win. Look, when you have taken on the preeminent sports league in the country, if not the world, and have taken them to the brink of a trial when they have tried to throw everything that they can at you. Damn it. Sorry. Sorry. Let me start that answer again. Go ahead. Since I know we're not live. I think it's already been victorious for St. Louis to take on the preeminent sports league in the country, if not the world, and push them to the brink of a trial where they've got no way out. At this point, it's framed up. It's settle the case or try the case. And they didn't want to be there. They don't want to be in front of a St. Louis judge. They don't want to be in front of a St. Louis jury. It's already a victory. You've already gotten 
a pretty significant pound of flesh by making the Eagles worry about it this far. The question is, how many more victories are still to come? Last thought. You have a book coming out, Playmakers, How the NFL Really Works or Doesn't. Tell me about it. Well, I've been doing this for 20 years now, and I have learned a lot about the way the NFL operates. So what I did with the guidance from my literary agent, David Black, and help from my publisher, we went back over the last 20 years. And instead of preaching about the various principles that come to play in the broader NFL business, we selected in 100 and 110 specific examples of things that have happened over the course of the last 20 years, broken down into 10 different categories, and by retelling the story, adding some new information where we were able to get it, and kind of drawing the principles out of that. When you read the whole thing and you get to the end, you say, boy, I really understand how this league works, and I'm not sure I like 100% of what I learned. 